There are more than 365,000 missing children in our country each year. Child trafficking, so profitable because children are used five to 10 times a day versus a bag of cocaine is like a one-time sale for that day. There's a lot of children changing hands and for what reason? You know, we know that there's organ harvesting. We know that there's there's the sex trade, but I don't see that the level of perversion of a full-grown man who would prefer a child over a full-grown female adult. What's up, what's up, everybody? Today, I have a very special guest on the podcast, Craig Salman Sawyer. He is a former U.S. Navy SEAL a US, Na uh, U.S. Air Marshal, excuse me. He was part of the Navy SEAL Dev Group uh, team, which is a Naval Special Warfare Development Group. This is as top of the rank in the Navy SEALs as it gets. I'm not an Army guy, but I have read a bit about it. And to be a Dev Group member, you have to be, you have to have some of the strongest mindset to go into that type of operation. Uh, he has also been honored with a heroic service. Um, you're going to give us a little bit more about it, uh, Craig. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. But the main topic of the podcast will be a topic that I find so important, so kind of controversial, where a lot of people do not want to discuss it. It's child trafficking and what you have done for child trafficking and rescuing children because it is a major, major problem in America, especially, and around the world. Thank you for coming on. Privileged to be on, and I appreciate you having me on to spread the word, because people need to and deserve to know what's really happening. I, I do agree. I do agree. Here's some statistics. Normally, I make videos on YouTube for credit cards and finances, but this is such a topic that I wanted to cover. I even, in fact, last night with my wife, watched Sound of Freedom to get the perspective and the emotion. Guys, go check out that movie. It's in regards to child trafficking. Um, I also watched your trailer as well on your website, and we'll link it below in regards to um, your uh, work with child trafficking and, and how it happens. But here's some statistics, everybody. Estimated 40 million people worldwide and 50,000 people in the United States are victim to human trafficking, according to some research we've done on Google. Child sex trafficking is in all 50 states. Um, it's the biggest states. I'm not surprised. California is one of them. Uh, but Texas and Florida, uh, I, I would assume because of the border for Texas and California as well. Las Vegas is becoming a hot spot. Um, there are more than 365,000 missing children in our country each year. Um, some of these stats may be a little bit outdated, and you could correct me if I'm wrong at any point, Craig, uh, as, as I've also watched in the movie that this is such a growing, growing business, or I would say it's almost like an empire. It's $150 billion a year business. It surpassed gun trafficking, correct? And now it might surpass uh, the drug trade. In the movie Sound of Freedom, they also mentioned that child trafficking is uh, so profitable because children are used five to 10 times a day versus a bag of cocaine is like a one-time sale for that day. And you have that child for X amount of years and maybe even into their teenage years by these pimps um, to continue profiting from, and it's just disgusting. And it, it seems to me, for some reason, a big draw is America. A lot of people in America allow this to happen. We're also big consumers of, obviously, the drug trade. Can you, can you go into a little bit about the statistics uh, uh, in there and how out of hand this has gotten? What we have found is the stats are kind of all over the map. Nobody really has hard stats on it including the center of uh, missing exploited children because this is a very dark and heinous crime. And when I first learned about it, I realized what what's going on with child trafficking inside the continental United States is that it, it is a covert operation run at industrial scale. And when I say industrial scale, 
before we abandoned our border three years ago, the estimate for child trafficking uh, annual revenue was 38 to 50 billion dollars 50 then the 38 that means it exceeds all pro sports combined in its annual revenue so there's a lot of children changing hands and for what reason you know we know that there's organ harvesting we know that there's there's the sex trade but i don't see that the level of perversion of a full-grown man who would prefer a child over a full-grown female adult would would it exceed the, the the rates that we're seeing it just doesn't make any rational sense to me in our investigations we're finding out the different layers of this crime all bad for ch the children all of it bad but you have everything from what people refer to as the global elite the high net worth people that run much of the the global banking and so forth all the way down to ms-13 and local gangbangers selling them out of clapped out hotel rooms and abandoned motels and uh, even parents selling their own children in the United States as well as third world nations and even children learning to sell themselves because uh, it makes them somehow feel empowered. Wow. It's a wide range of it. It's really what's going on. So the stats are really, there. there's a wide possibility of how you put the numbers to it depending on how you're measuring it. Sure. So, so you're saying that um, the demand there is obviously a demand for sex child trafficking, but it's also not just sales uh, ch child trafficking. It's also maybe potential slave labor, um, organs, um, and or even you know just human trafficking together. It's combined into very big aspects or categories. So it's not just a sex problem. It's also a problem of potentially uh, organ uh, harvesting and so forth. Well, we deal with the 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 aspects of it that we can prove in a court of law. 26 arrests on child predators with a 100% conviction rate and another 17 warrants that should be being in the pipeline to be served. So when the when predators come to our sting operations, there's typically an ad put out. We run joint operations with federal and local law enforcement. So we'll, or even just a new profile of some social media profile, mm -hmm. the predators will come running for that child in a way that would turn your stomach. I don't care where you've been in the world. When you see the, the level of vulgarity, the nature of these conversations, and it will go from an initial, hi, how are you? Straight into the next sentence is something disgusting. Oh, these predators are, are compelled very strongly by something to get at this child and, and do whatever they have in mind to do to the child. So the compulsion is very, very strong. It's unlike any other thing I've seen other than you know a desperate crack addict that just has to have that next hit do you think they're they're mentally mentally ill craig like would you put them in that category or would you say that there's some type of trauma that maybe uh occurred with these predators especially the ones that you've caught um, because i have spoken to criminal lawyers before and, and sadly some of them had to defend some of these um predators through public defender's offices and so forth where they get assigned this case and um, they say that these people feel like they can't help themselves in some regard i don't know if this is obviously the truth i think it's completely disgusting and shows lack of control for anything but um why do you think there's such a demand or why do you think there's such a like drive to lure a child to take advantage of a helpless child um, to, I mean, it's bad enough selling, say, meth and seeing a family be destroyed, but to take a little kid that is singing and that's joyful and just completely take the soul out of them and to the point where they're just not a person, um, it's just, I mean, I, I, like you said, you've seen some things being in the dev guru unit, but this is just flat out evil. Is, is, I guess, the way I would put it. Why, why do you think that is? Interesting that, that you would use that word because anybody who deals with this for any period of time or at any depth comes back with that word. And I think we use that word for that, which is clearly not natural and organic. You, you don't find any other species just totally 
traumatizing and systematically eradicating their own offspring like humans are doing right now. It's nothing that hasn't happened throughout human history, but it, it seems to ebb and flow according to the spirituality of the nation that that's dealing with, with this. So, you know, um, what we're, we're finding is a lot of people who are traumatized in their youth and they're abused do tend to be abusers and traumatize others rather than being a beacon of light and hope and, and a protector. I celebrate those who do overcome it and decide very deliberately to be a mama bear or a papa bear and say, hey, no more, not, not on my watch, not around me. I'm going to be one that, that disrupts this chain of events and brings about a more positive direction and, and outcome. But when a friend of mine from the CIA that let me know that child trafficking in the in the in northern Houston, mm -hmm. uh, North Harris County had become the hottest epicenter of child trafficking in the continental United States due to uh, the, the the major highways that flow through there from the border, and uh, you got major east, west, north, and south uh, highways. We've got a lot of oil money. There, there's every manner of potential, and so he goes, "Yeah, this is this is." what's going on here and i couldn't reconcile that with our culture some healthy pro-america you know there were churches on every corner in texas yeah in southern texas i mean we love our, our jesus and our usa and our football and pretty pretty whole what i would think was a wholesome culture and he said well that's just the thing this is run right under people's noses because they don't even know to look for it and so mm -hmm. it's like it and I, th I thought that's okay that's a covert operation then i understand that i've worked in the intelligence community the highest level of counterterrorism, and uh and um in the state department as well and, and diplomatic community and and i just i started realizing the fingerprints of government involvement on this and i thought well nothing runs at this scale in the u.s without the government getting its hands in it and wanting their cut so you cannot open a lemonade stand without, you know, being throttled by some representative of the, of the government because they want that tax money, baby. They want to make sure you pay. They do with it, right? They're sending it to other foreign nation states, tens of billions at a time and squandering it, wasting it. They don't want to answer for that, but boy, they want it. If you, if you, if you make 10 bucks, they're going to expect their cut. How is it that we have? anywhere from 38 to 50 even up upwards to 100 billion dollar a year criminal enterprise and the government is magically unaware yeah. which is the exact opposite of every other crime so i realized okay this is a covert operation it's domestic government run at, at the very highest levels and it is run at industrial scale so there's a lot of top cover mm -hmm. and i started learning that district attorneys are paid their their campaigns are funded by a certain globalist billionaire who subscribes to global marxism under which there is no united states there is no god the state becomes everything to them and that model he wants that and their great reset that they talk about and you're, you're dealing in a financial realm you'll understand it involves breaking the economy of the united states so that people are desperate enough to say please government give us a solution they're like yeah we have this marxist model yeah we're going to call it democratic socialism because they've always called communism democratic socialism throughout history before they bring it in so it's like it's like democratic socialism is like the candy of a rape van and you take the candy you go inside and it's a gorilla rape van of, of global marxism they're like yeah now welcome to the here's your wake-up call and so dealing with that and, and watching these district attorneys funded by this globalist billionaire with the agreement he you know, he says i'll fund you and get you into that seat but in that seat you're gonna not prosecute certain categories of harmful crimes child trafficking and child rape are some of those crimes george soros does not want those crimes punished where does that leave you and me if we have children in that city or that district or that state it's it's insane and uh you know even elon musk said hey soros realized that he could get a lot more for his buck at local government right local district attorneys local um uh you know state assemblymen and so forth versus going all the way up to the top where maybe it takes a lot more money to convince someone 
with this corruption. And, and you know, me being from Russia, I'm no, um, I was a young boy when I came here. I'm no, um, um, uh, no stranger to hearing stories of communism and how the government is the most important thing. Rat on your brother, give up your mom and dad. We know better for you. Don't have more food. Rely on us for everything. And all of that collapses, right? Um, and it's not, um, it's not, uh, it's not sustainable. And, and it's very dangerous. And you're absolutely right. All this money being sent, uh, going back to that as well. I, I said it before, you know, on the podcast, all this money being sent out, where is it going? Who's handling it? Who's receiving it? It's all being washed, in my opinion. And it, and and um, and there's another podcaster you may want to look up, Michael Francis. He was an ex-mafia uh, um, guy who's doing now YouTube, but he talks about it. He's like, hey, the, the government's like a mob. They're even worse. They have all the power. They have everything. They can do whatever they want. They could control whatever you want. And going back to your point, how does an operation of so many children, so many people uh, pass through without the government going, hey, this is okay or it's not okay or what should we stop? And it, and it's probably at the highest level, like you said. Um <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit more about that, um, and we'll kind of go back to your uh, career at, with the government and uh, the Navy SEALs, the Dev, Ru, uh, Dev uh, Group. Uh, group. Um, talk a little bit about that. Why did you decide to go from that career path? Um, and, <clears throat> and you kind of dedicated, I would say, your life to defending the United States to making sure the United States remains um, the top, um, one of the top places to live. It was supposed to be a safe place in the 60s and the 70s, 80s. I feel like we're the best years, maybe around that, maybe 70s, 80s, 90s even. Uh, but the, what made you want to change and pivot and say, hey, this is more important? And what was the conflict for you mentally? Because you've been working so much to defend the United States. And now you're kind of going, hey, I've defended this country. I put my life on the line. I mean, you probably in a later podcast, if you choose to come on, describe some of these missions or what it takes to be a, a dev group member and some of these Navy SEAL operations. But how does your mind shift and the battle of conflict between your mind of what the United States is doing now and where you were? And how did you pivot to defending children and knowing that the government may be involved. I mean, that's kind of a, a, a tough, tough thing to battle with. I'm having to, I'm having to remake myself to fight in a totally different type of conflict now. So I was raised Simon in a very loving family, a strong Christian family. And my mother and father had strong moral values and ethical standards and integrity. And my father was a man of his word. He did what he said. And he gave and gave and gave to countless people. And it got to where I couldn't come home in that area around the woodlands, Texas, and take my parents anywhere to eat without people coming up and thanking him and hugging him for what he gave to their family when they're, you know, one of them was dying in the hospital or one of them was in prison or, you know, just all a long list of, of scenarios. And I thought, man, my gosh, how much must this man have given before I can't take him anywhere without people coming up and celebrating and just begging him to remember the things that he did for their family. So I grew up under that model and a giver and a, somebody that was respectable and genuine. Most people remember King David as the small shepherd boy in the Bible that took out a thousand pound Nephilim giant with a slingshot. Well, that is something that it, it is, um, it's not just a some sort of myth or fairy tale. The, the local people will show you the valley where that took place. And so I realized that was a guy that that had um, the right kind of heart for a warrior. And and you know, as he as he served as a king of his nation and and how he served and like a a godly warrior was that was my observation of him. He was like a, not only a strong warrior, but he was tuned into his creator, and that's where he drew his strength from. That's why he, why he was willing to face a giant that his entire own army of grown men and in, in armor were shaking and wouldn't go out to fight this thing. And little David said, I'll kill it. I'll go kill it. I'll do it. I, and, and he had that level of confidence and faith. So 
<clears throat> that was my model as a warrior. And I loved our culture here in the United States. I loved the fact that we had peace and we could have barbecues and we could go water skiing or just whatever we do, we could work and pursue happiness and pursue our own dreams in a peaceful environment. And I knew that that wasn't free. I knew that it had to be fought for and defended and protected because of the rest of this world wanted to come take that and disrupt that. And um, mm -hmm. so I went off, you know, into the Marine Corps to go into force recon. They didn't quite have the program going that they had in years past. And they said, if you really want to do the big stuff, you should have gone to the SEAL teams because mm -hmm. they have all the money and the operations and the support. And um, I said, well, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there from here then. So I got out of the Marine Corps, over to the Navy, did that, went to the highest level. And then it was, again, back to, I, I'd served in several other agencies, and it was a friend of mine from Houston that described to me the nature of child trafficking there. And I just, I felt assaulted, like, like evil had come to my front door, my hometown where I'd grown up, and it felt invasive, and it felt so hostile and one of the agents that we were talking to one of the federal law enforcement agents said um craig we don't care how good you are or the badge and the gun or your investigations this child this thing with the children is a spiritually motivated crime it's very weird and creepy and it's different than any other crime you've dealt with and unless you can find a way to deal with this spiritually from a very high level what you're going to find is you're always going to be just confused and confounded with regular techniques. And you're never going to find the guys that you're looking for and you'll never understand why. Because these people resort to a lot of witchcraft and ceremony and ritual to spiritually protect themselves from the dark side. So they're harming children and they do enjoy a cloak of secrecy that protects them from legal prosecution and even from pro, uh, public awareness. And I thought, that sounds weird. And that you can't, it'd be a heck of a time trying to prove that in a court of law. Because yeah. I was a federal criminal investigator. But at the same time, Simon, I knew what they were saying was true. Because I'd seen my father deal straight on with people that were demonically possessed and oppressed and all kinds of things. And I saw him never in fear but i saw him deal with this thing and i saw where the power comes from and uh there's one source of true power in this universe and it's the creator and everybody else is just playing pretend so i knew that that was the score but i realized i wasn't spiritually at the level i needed to be to combat this level of crime that was that man i had a lot of growing to do spiritually so it's like it's like a warrior that's, you know, you're good hand-to-hand -hand fighter. You're good with with pistols and sniper rifles and belt-fed machine guns and rockets and mortars and call for fire and all that other kind of stuff. So the weapons are kinetic. You've got that. You've got the physical training. Your body's healthy. Your mind's healthy. You're, but there's one room of your house, to use a different uh, analogy, that's that you haven't built that house out yet. And that's the spiritual room, you know in your house in your home you're like well i'll get around to building that one one day once you get in there and you start building that room out you realize this is the most glorious and powerful and amazing room in your whole house and that's what i started doing is building out that my spirituality and, and it wasn't that i didn't know that there are people that are genuinely tuned into their creator but i realized i cared enough for whatever reason that it pained me genuinely to know that so many children are being harmed and that it's being allowed and i'm like okay i have to find out whatever is going to disrupt that and and exposure was the biggest thing I, I kept realizing with any covert operation exposure is the biggest catastrophe that it could encounter of it show the american citizens what's happening here so that they can get heartbroken at the filth and the harm and enraged at it and make a cultural change make so that's what i'm out to do with veterans for child rescue i founded the organization just because i had to to get around all the big tech um obstacles that they were throwing in front of me that mm -hmm. the big tech did not want to allow us to crowdfund this documentary mm -hmm. film didn't want the people to be empowered with knowing that this is going on right under our noses because too many people are, are benefiting from the corrupt status quo and so i founded the org 
we started rallying the, the funding that way to uh, make the documentary and show the people. And in, uh, in so doing, by filming the documentary, I realized that my law enforcement background opened some doors with law enforcement that um, we could run joint operations. My background and pedigree, and we would run joint sting operations. So my team would run the sting and uh, law enforcement would move into the room and effect takedown and cuff the prisoner up, the, the perp, and drive him down to the station and process him and we'd bring the next one in. So, And we showed that in Contraland so that we could show people how quickly predators came, even in affluent areas where people are doing pretty well financially, they're successful, but there are predators anywhere and everywhere. So I think it's a good wake up call, even with law enforcement going, oh my God, after the third or fourth arrest, you know, in one or two days, they're like, we didn't realize we had this level of problem here. And so there's the lesson, there's the, the wake up call, the elevation of consciousness or just simple awareness of, hey, we got ourselves a problem here too. It's everywhere now. And and I think the reason why it's not just financial, Simon, yeah, there's a lot of money being made and there is a level of sexual perversion, but I don't think the sexual perversion is enough to drive the scale that we're witnessing and that's spilling out now in all these law enforcement cases and all these whistleblowers from HHS and CIA and and other agencies that have been involved in this, they're like, hey, this is big, man. And so we started investigating. We started having more and more witnesses and survivors come out who had been involved in satanic ritual abuse. That was a wake-up call for me. I thought satanic groups were kind of like um, KKK. There was a handful of them here or there. There might be eight or ten people in each state that were Satanist or in a witch's coven and they were just weird and they did their little dances in the woods and whatever. I don't subscribe to that. And I couldn't see how it could be a big problem. It is. Yeah, I was wrong. And here's, and here's the real deal. JFK, John F. Kennedy warned us about secret societies in a very powerful speech he gave as president of the United States. Cause he saw it. He, he was dealing with it. The way that it works is you could have X, Y, Z agency or X, Y, Z institution, even could be a religious institution or NGO or what have you. Their forward facing entities are, they have a certain charter and funding and they're supposed to be providing a, a service to the public in good faith. And that's how we know them. Well, the key figures we're finding out and the tops of some of these organizations have a back door and the back door, they're members of secret societies that they don't talk about. And in those secret societies, there are groups like the Masons and, and many others that they swear blood oaths to, and they spend decades going through certification and getting you know higher and higher. The problem is at the very top ranks, it turns, everything gets inverted and the members who have wasted, you know, 20 or 30 years getting there and, and they've sworn all these blood oaths and they're, they're, they're committed to it. Their elders, if you will, bring them into a ceremony and say, okay, now here's how it really is for us cool guys at the top. And it's a literally a robe wearing satanic child raping uh, cult group. And they're like, yeah, if you're one of us, you know, we can get you into other key, um, key positions, get you a big salary, big retirement. You know, you can have the chief of police on speed dial. You'll never get a harassing you. They'll cover it up or they'll get rid of it. And we have a network, a good old boys club. And, uh, you know, just just do what we tell you. And you get, you'll, you're the beneficiary of this, this, this club, right? Well that's where you get into the spiritual clash. And I'm going to say this, there'll be a percentage of your listeners who absolutely know it. Another percentage who think it's or aware of it, think it's probably true, but don't know for sure. And another percentage will be like, ah, that's hogwash. But here's what we are learning. And if you research it, I am confident you'll figure it out too. Satan and God almighty are at conflict. Satan enjoys harming the creator by in by motivating humans to inflict harm on the children the god's purest most pure most innocent most high vibrating most loving 
humans on earth are the little precious children connected to all the riffraff yeah they just love and they want to be loved obviously loves them dearly and he's pained by anytime they're harmed or defiled so that's where there's always a sexual component mm -hmm. satan gets off on poisoning and destroying and ruining that that outlook of that soul so that they're not high vibrating they're not loving they're not trusting they're not looking for something higher looking for their creator and a higher path in this beautiful life that's just mm -hmm. and so in it what it does it they they do it through deep horrific prolonged trauma and agony they are cruel to these children in a systematic way that we learned from the nazi scientists after world war ii we brought it from operation paperclip we brought a lot of the nazi scientists over from the psychology psychological realm and from the rocket science uh, like mm -hmm. Werner von braun and all his colleagues to, to found nasa which which mm -hmm. they did a lot of a lot so, of ex-nazis here of course yeah and um so the the trauma-based programming that they do on these these children in these rituals and ceremonies allows them to control those children as they grow and use them as a as a, a type of slave they can task them with all kinds of different things and we're talking about um split personalities the trauma splits them into schizophrenia and each of the different personality parts they call them get programmed to conduct a different skill set it's very sophisticated very detailed i won't get into that but that's part of what they do that's part of the power that the the cult members gain from doing this harm but there's always a destruction of the children there's a lot of sacrifice like murder ritual murder sacrifice and that's where they get the the power there's i thought remote viewing was just some CIA programs where if we wanted to see the latest, you know, Russian um, nuke sub launched, you know, secretly, and we couldn't find it on satellite, that remote viewers could sit in a room and do that. Well, that that does happen, but these cult members and the the higher ranking ones and these coven, which is coven leaders, uh, can make common use of these spiritual powers dark and very futile very foolish because they're dooming them themselves to hell as mm -hmm. eternal souls they're they're guaranteeing that they're going to end up in eternal torment rather than paradise so i don't understand why anyone would agree to do that but that's what we're learning very factually from hundreds of survivors now of this abuse yeah many of these survivors now quite well healed miraculously so considering what they've been through but when they detail with you what was done to them it's 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 soul crushing simon very very painful to listen to and i'm not even the victim i'm just a, i'm just a witness hearing what this person's been through and it's it makes it's you want to cry crazy. it's it's it's, it's gut-wrenching i mean it's it's uh uh just even watching the movie i watched your trailer i'm gonna watch um uh contra land as well um maybe tonight but and I'll link everything, of course, but even just watching that movie yesterday, it's very uh, emotional. It made me teary eyed. It's it's gut wrenching and to for a child or even uh, a teenager to overcome being taken from uh, their parents and really just uh, being put through not only what you say, these rituals, but even um, being pimped out to these uh either rich and, and it seems like it's not just rich wealthy you know people that are taking them in and, and having them do these things it's any it's anywhere and anybody and there's just so many levels that you've uncovered that not only is this happening for sexual exploit but it's happening for labor it's happening for every single other component you mentioned something earlier in the podcast which is very interesting right um, you know, it's not only cartels, but also gangs that uh, traffic children. And I'm sure the government is aware of it um, and maybe involved in it, et cetera. But how does an MS-13, for example, a uh, gang member traffic a child yet in the prison system? If you are a predator or pedophile, from my understanding, typically the prison members go really hard on those type of individuals that get caught i mean they have to be protected and so forth it's almost like a, a the same conflict uh that you're facing of hey here i'm supposed to protect uh the united states i see the united states rotting from these evil um you know intentions 
and yet the government may be involved or allowing it to happen. So there's a conflict there, and there's a conflict of a MS-13 gang member and uh, maybe, a, let's say, like a Mexican mafia inside the prison cells trying to harm the pedophiles that they're also enabling on the outside. It's kind of a weird thing, would you say? or is They have special units, special prison units to put the pedophiles in. Because the murderers and the rapists will kill a pedophile. Because yeah. even, even they see the devil in a pedophile. There's something that's not organic, that's not natural about rape, you know, taking a, a diaper off to, to rape an infant oh, or a toddler. Yeah. Right? Even even a murderer is like, oh, probably that, that pedophile. Man. But why do they tolerate it on the outside? I would assume the same MS-13 or the same cartel members that get caught eventually get put in this prison ward. All of a sudden... It feels like they just switch sides out there. You know what I mean? It's kind of like if you're enabling or is it not every individual, it's kind of hard to justify it. Certainly not every individual. You know, even there are cartel members that won't have anything to do with harming children. They're just like, sorry, me a little bit better than I'll murder people and torture adults, but I won't rape children's kind of there. We're seeing a downward spiral in standards. So the more people learn that there's money to be made, it's it's like a race to the bottom of humanity. The it's more crazy. people, the more criminals learn that they can make money, the more we're hearing about them in prison saying, I can't wait to get out so I can sell children. Yeah. Just thinking, well, what, what's going to happen? How is this going to end up? Resort to even new lows to make a dollar. I, it seems like they just justify saying, well, if it's not me doing it, Someone else is going to do it. And then they're just dismissing the fact of that this is pure evil and, and enabling their mind to think that, hey, this is acceptable behavior. And, and it's weird. You mentioned earlier social media and, and probably even this video is going to get demonetized from uh, YouTube or wherever. Uh, social media, um, the media in general, for some reason is putting a little... Uh, blanket on exposing these things. They're not really wanting to have YouTubers or have anybody really talk about this in depth. Um, even recently, uh, Tim Ballard, who was part of that movie, is experiencing some controversy. Um, they're trying to kind of uh, defame him or, or make him seem like um, he did something wrong. I don't know if you saw that. Um, but but it's 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 to the point where Social media is also not accepting for individuals like you to come out and talk about it. That must be very frustrating for you. Well, a long time ago, I started tracing up to the very top the news media corporations and who owns and runs those and what their global outlook is as far as uh, their politics and what, it, what, what model they subscribe to. And at the top of the news media, they're all global Marxists. Well, you have the same thing in big tech. All of the big execs at the top of the big tech corporations, Facebook, Twitter, X, you name it, all of them. You know, Elon Musk is a little bit of an anomaly. I mean, I'm still censored horribly on X, even though he's been at, at the wheel for a while. None of them want child trafficking fully exposed and eradicated. They don't. Uh, their colleagues, maybe themselves, are uh, neck deep in this in this realm. When you when you look at how difficult it is to have the flight logs made public from Jeffrey Epstein's island, and that's just one group of of covert intelligence community brownstoning operations as a type of blackmail um, that's going on. It's going on around the world. Galena. Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were not, I say again, were not the only group doing that. It's widespread. Just about any politician, if he pulls up in a bar near D.C., he can assume that ladies approaching him are, are honeypots, man. They capture some scoop. And, um, you know, it used to be that a politician used to have to have an affair, and that was a scandal back in the 50s. And mm -hmm. they could leverage him over that. Mm -hmm. Well, they can't anymore because nobody cares. Our morality has decreased. Our standards have decreased. We don't care. Yeah, you cheated on then your it, wife, so what? And then it had to be a homosexual affair. So now right. you know you're 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 you know it's less socially acceptable. Oh, okay, so that would work. Now people don't care about that. They're like, we don't care what you do. Um, it has to be children. So mm -hmm. thank God there's still 
the majority of, of humans that'll say, oh, we don't care what you do in the bedroom, but better leave the kids out of it or we're coming for you. That's the game. Children and a lot of these scumbags that want to be in charge of everything, they, you know, they're wired to do these acts of perversion. And when they are flown to a castle overseas or a, or down to a mansion on an island or in you know Manhattan or wherever, or a resort, they'll follow their noses and, you know, get involved in every manner of hookers and blow and children and everything else and get very quickly caught on video to where the cabal, the, the crime, the criminal network really control them and own them. Not me and you, the taxpayer anymore. Yeah. You're not going to get like, if you ran for office or you wanted to get some high level and some real institution that, that wielded real power, you couldn't unless they had you on video and they knew they could control you. Otherwise you could be a threat to every, their kingdom, their, their right. corrupt kingdom, uh, where so many things are so uh, infested now. So saturated with the corruption that nothing's really working right anymore. We need a major swamp draining. We need a major house cleaning so that we can restore integrity so that our institutions are effective so that uh, we, we can maintain peace and freedom and liberty and we can pursue happiness and you and I can make a dollar. We could be entrepreneurs and create something, a product or service and, and actually benefit from it rather than, you know, the government bonk us and over the head with taxes and say, nope, well, I'll take half of that and I'm going to give it to someone who's not productive. In my hump, if you're going to take it from me yeah. and give it to someone that, that can't be bothered to bust their hump. No, I mean, or, or, sent, or sent overseas to God knows what, to be clean. It destroys, and that's my whole problem with, with big government models, not to get into a political discussion, but that's part of what the dynamic we're fi fighting here is when the government gets too big and it taxes people too heavily it, it destroys incentive he's an overachiever man he makes all the good stuff happen he does his chores and he just crushes it and um and another one that just can't be bothered he, he he's not productive at anything well if you're going to keep punishing the overachiever and taking his stuff and giving it to the one that doesn't do anything you've killed incentive by both of them you've reinforced the guy that does nothing it's the opposite effect. You're discouraging the achiever and you're encouraging the lazy uh, behavior, the behavior that's going to rot the, the country or the, the home and uh, yeah. and the future generation. I completely agree uh, with you. It's and we basic, can have that basic human human nature. Yeah. You know, it's just I, how it is. Listen, I live in the Bay Area. I know exactly how it is out here. Uh, so it's one tough place to live. I don't mean to be getting you in trouble. Say, yeah, say no, no, things, I don't hey. care. Hey, I'll be the homily here. I don't, I don't listen. I, I, I love these type of discussions. Um, you know, um, not, I'm not going to go into my life and any of that. This is about you. And uh, and I truly appreciate it. Let's talk. Let's get back to uh, Contraland and uh, Vets for uh, Child Rescue. Why did you make the film and uh, why should someone watch this film? Uh, what, what is something to take away from this um, is, is going to be a good thing to, to get back into. So why did you make the film? Uh, why should somebody watch this film? Should parents, you know, and we'll discuss parents and educating their children in this afterwards. Uh, but go ahead, give me that answer. Why Contraland? Why Vets for Child Rescue in terms of what can someone take out of this? Contraland to show the American people what they would not believe if you and I walked up on the street and told them the truth. Truth is so dark and so disappointing and so upsetting that we as humans tend to block it out and turn away. Let there be no more turning away. Let me show the people what is really going on so that they can understand and then bring about a cultural turnaround Love stronger that. legislation stronger punishment against predators because it is not compassionate to allow a predator right back out to continue harming others there's no compassion in that at all in fact it's foolish and and reckless and irresponsible and negligent so we have to stop the predators from harming the 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 little ones so that's that's why i made it i wanted to to and i love the american people knowledge is power and i wanted to empower them with the knowledge of what's happening and we just we ran joint sting operations we brought in experts and uh survivors and just showed the viewers what's happening and explained to them how it works and that was just the first information we were 
exposed to when I founded Vets for Child Rescue. Since since then, and that's fairly. Some people say they had to watch it in several sections because mm -hmm. it's a bit of a gut punch. Mm -hmm. The information of like, ooh, I just saw five thousand predators respond to a local ad in Guilford, Connecticut. Five thousand predators responded to rape a twelve-year-old girl. My God, that is in incredibly disgusting and, and it's such a large number of people i mean you can't five thousand people in 30 days that's what that's hundreds of people a day i mean that's that's almost 200 150 or so or 120 let's say people a day uh that's incredible and how do you even yeah. respond to all of them to trap them i mean how do you you can't, you can't look we have our chatters we, we like to run male and female chatters i call them chatters they're the people that that put ads or profiles out on social media that interact with the predator that wants to come and and rape a child in our operations and so they will be working multiple laptops and phones and, and as fast as they can and they can't keep up with it all there will yeah. be five or ten predators respond let's say a, let's say a 15 year old girl puts out a, or let's say a 12 year old girl puts out an ad, a new page for social media. Hi, I'm Harry or whatever her name is. And a picture, and you know, I like butterflies. Kids like butter or whatever she likes. Like just starting like a, a, an ad, a profile. No content, nothing suggestive, just a child's. Hi, 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 hi. There's like, pop-ups, these guys reaching out, bing, 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 bing. And after the first, hi, hello, how are you? Then it's straight to the sexual content. Wow. So after a few minutes, there can be dozens of these predators knocking on this child's uh, profile. And, this, and there's nothing about the profile that indicates the child is, is amicable to anything sexual, yeah. but yet these, and so that's what we wanted to kind of show people is like, it, they're not somewhere else. They're not only somewhere else. They're in your hometown. You're, if you have children or grandchildren, they are vulnerable. And might it be prudent for us to take concerted action to rectify this culturally so that this is not this pervasive and this prevalent? Like this is this is unsustainable. It's incredible. It, 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 seems, it seems the internet has made it a lot easier to share pictures, this, that, contact people. I mean, I remember AOL chat rooms when I grew up as a kid, and you wouldn't know who the hell you're talking to on there. And um, But now it's also, uh, I see, you know, um, you may be against it, but our daughters have a phone, and we text each other in the family group, and it's kind of cute, and they send these little photos and so forth. Uh, but they get these random text messages coming into the phone. Hey, how are you? You know what I mean? And it's like, and they go, Dad, who's this? And I go, do not respond. Do not respond. They're probably trying to take your money. But I would imagine they're not only going after Facebook, but they're probably, after you mentioned this, they're texting to see who's that on the other line through some texter or some random um, thing to see, hey, is this a 10-year-old? Is this a 12-year-old? Is this a 15-year-old? And and probably also luring people that way as well. So that's something we're going to discuss as far as watching them. Um, what, uh, what do you recommend for parents? What do you recommend for parents? What are some signs of kind of making sure that you're empowering children, you're educating children. And and I know in some cases it's not preventable, like the mom turns around and I've seen videos of a child being abducted on a motorcycle somewhere. But what do you recommend parents, some of the red flags that they should be aware of um, to not get caught in this web of evil? Well, you know, a lot of parents that are really active in their children's development are now issuing them flip phones until they're 18. They're like, sorry, you could text me, you can uh, you can call me, you can call 911, you can do what you need, but predators can't reach you. They can't yeah. find you. Flip phone. And that while that may sound extreme to some, I would say uh, when you get a call in the middle of the night that your daughter's either missing or that she's just been raped, there's probably nothing you wouldn't go back and redo um, to make her safer or him um they're after the boys too 
So I'll just fly that across the table gently for anybody that might want to consider that option. But it's really having a conversation with your kid. You know, open the door, ask them what they're into. Uh, try to just listen. And, and um, you know, we, we want to lecture our kids because we want them to know, to hear the truth. But uh, those that are really good with kids, uh, those who are better with kids than I apparently was with mine, say you really just listen a whole lot more <laughs> and, and let them, you know, carry the, the conversation and, uh, and you can kind of see a little bit better where they're heading and, and where you might be able to intervene. But um, talk to them, find out who's in their life, who are they hanging with, who are they talking with, and make them generally aware of the predation online. And I'm not talking about terrorize them and steal their joy and ruin their childhood. I'm saying let them be aware that other children that they're talking to may online may not be other children. They're probably mm -hmm. full-grown adults and that uh, they may have harm in mind for your child. So even if that thought is there, they can go, oh, okay, they can make more reasonable assertions or, or, or assumptions on whether or not they want to carry a conversation any further or, you know, share the dangers of uh, sextortion of sharing uh, sexually explicit images of yourself with other kids that you think like you and they come to find out, nope, it's a full grown predator and he's threatening to share it with your entire school. If you don't send him more and he's sending it out to internet to other predators and the whole thing's bad or children, you know, they commit suicide, suicide mm -hmm. many times because that they can't get around it. Like mom and dad's going to, you know, they're going to have a heart attack if they find out I did this and it's never going to be okay. And they take their own lives and it's so sad and tragic and it need not be. So um, go through their apps, through their phones, see what apps are in there and let them know we've got a list of problematic and dangerous apps on our website, v4cr.org. Mm -hmm. If you go on there, you can find a lot of these red flagged apps and make sure they're not on your kid's phone. And whatever your kid is, your children are using, make sure that you understand, um, you know, the settings and that they're not being geolocated or remotely viewed. And, and those kinds of things, because they can be very quickly compromised. And, and you know what's interesting? Um, uh, communication, I think, is key. Um, I think children also should be taught to seek help. Oftentimes, they're also, we're seeing predators come out even in schools. Like, there was a big sting that happened, and there was teachers involved. There's people at Disneyland working there involved in, in certain areas where they're, you know, it's, it's kind of like... Um, uh, the predators will be around the prey, right? It's it's human nature, it's animalistic nature. So we got to be also, I would add to that, um, I think I tell my kids all the time, hey, you, the people in your school, your teachers, they're just there to teach you certain math and certain things, but you got to be honest with me if they tell you anything else. Because nowadays, I don't, you know, after all these things have come to light, I don't trust anybody out there. And it could be anywhere. And you mentioned it can be anywhere. And it, it rapidly increases. Look how many, you said 5,000 people in 30 days reached out to rape a little girl. It's sick. Um, so definitely thank you for sharing that communication and really letting the, the, the kids know that the parents need, kind of need to know everything and open up, right? You have to love them enough to invade their space that they are reasonably safe. Otherwise... It's it's gotten so precarious now to where it's it I would say it's negligent uh, not to basis you know some friends of ours say hey they take their children's phones until they're eighteen they take their kids' phones and they bring them into their master bedroom to plug them into charge overnight because you know they lock the windows and doors of the house and the vehicles at night and they took the kids in and they think the kids are safe but the kids pop up on their device and are being stalked and groomed right there in their own bedroom. So let's talk about age range, uh, Craig, age range is important. It, you know, people think it's, you know, teenagers, et cetera, but the age range is like rapid, right? It, it's, it, it's, it doesn't matter what age these children are. Is that correct? Yeah. On the darkest level of it with these satanic cult groups, they'll literally, um, I won't say it, uh, but they, they will defile and harm a child straight out of um, there's literally no low that these predators some of them won't go to 
So we see every range. And just because a child is 18, it doesn't make them adults. You know, uh, their university studies now are saying, oh, human brain's not fully developed until about 25. So as, a, as an 18 year old girl who's been kind of sheltered and coddled to a degree, is she really strong and capable at 18? No, she's yeah. still so vulnerable. So we have to just, you know, keep that awareness. Yeah around them and make sure that they're okay what are, what are the recovery rates like you recently helped find i saw on your instagram and i'll link it below um as well it's uh real underscore shaman um you uh recovered or helped recover a child i believe you know a teen uh she was about 18 years old according to the yeah, post she was 18 um and uh what what are the recovery rates and how does it feel recovering a child and bringing them back um, to, to to safety? Well, we've seen a lot of different type of scenarios and very few are like a um, Hallmark movie. You know, yeah. it's it's gritty. It's it's sometimes it's it's messy. It's complex. Many of them return to trafficking willfully because it's the nightmare that they're familiar with we rescued we had her a job we pulled her out of the torment uh she was in a local church going there with nice people around her she had a, a job her own bank account her driver's license because she was 16 by then and um and you know everything that would give her control of her own situation. And she's like, this is hard. Yes, ma'am, but nobody's going to hurt you now, right? You're not going to be abused. And, and, and anyway, she got re-traumatized. Somebody, uh, complicated event, chain of events. Somebody returned back into the town and this anyway. Um, but she and I feel she's quite a bit older now, but she's, She's doing better and she's clean now, no more drugs and all that. Uh, but she's she's making mild uh, recoveries. And we, we've learned though from a, a legitimate trafficking operation with a child that's been subjected to that to any period of time, a minimum of 18 to 24 months of in-house legitimate rehabilitation and, and counseling therapy. And we don't see any that are successful of any real positive long-term effect that are not faith-based can be no real healing from straight evil and abuse and trauma. It's just the damage is too great. And uh, there's only one that can piece us back together when we're shattered like that. So that it's beautiful to see when they do recover. We talked to from the satanic ritual abuse groups, some of them are amazingly well healed even though they've been through unspeakable. So it really, really varies. And it, it depends on the individual. Some have stronger willpower uh, internally than others. And some of them, you know, find a very personal relationship with the creator in a way that kind of elevates them and heals them much more rapidly than others. So we, we're kind of seeing a, a wide range, Simon. Of, so of, it, Craig, it sounds like it's start of the battle, the recovery happens, but then that individual or that child or teenager may be kind of institutionalized, they may not have home support, or some families maybe have loving families at home that support them through this process. And then in some cases, it's kind of like being a prisoner for 40 years, that's all you know, for example, so you maybe miss prison that you you were used to that lifestyle um and that's all you know um but to overcome it it starts it's it's like a separate challenge on its own for individuals like yourself that's that's since that's tough to swallow uh, especially if you bring someone in and they're back out there definitely too for all the family everybody that loves that person goes through the agony of their struggle um, it's like drug addiction and there often there is drug addiction involved because the predators utilize drugs. Wow. That's insane. It's almost like a double, um, double, I'm, I'm going to bring it back to money. It's more than money, but it's like a double profit for some of these criminals. They'll, they'll do the drugs and then they'll do the child. And it's, it's like, uh, they don't care which one they're selling. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, uh, they're, they're doubling up.
Um, let me ask, let's talk a little bit about technology and exploitation. Is there any technology, like you mentioned, you can't respond to 5,000 people. You've got 10 computers in an office responding to 5,000 predators. Why hasn't there been or is there an AI that's generated to combat this? And I think there should be. I think someone should come out with it that's much smarter than you and I for the technology aspect. But there needs to be AI that communicates with these individuals and to the point of a booked appointment, in my opinion, is there such a program or do you guys ever consider working with someone on such a program? We've got some brilliant detectives and investigators, and I'm writing down your question because the, I'm gonna, as soon as we get off this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them and say, hey, guys, why haven't we had this discussion? And maybe they probably have among themselves. It would be incredible. Very afraid of AI and, and the potential where it's going. But hey, if we can use it to catch bad guys, you know, before everything goes bad with it, I say you know, utilize the tool. I think AI is good is going to be good and bad. I think it'll take a lot of people's jobs, and it, and it's going to be horrible if it's not regulated properly. But in this case, uh, a chat bot that can lure a child, uh, sorry, a child predator, a chat bot that can lure a child predator, communicate with them to the point of a meeting. It could be geolocated. It'll know the maps and so forth. You'll tackle all 5,000 people. It's just a numbers game at that point. And, and who you can't get to, I mean, you'll, you, that chat bot will save a life for sure. Like if, if you could get to that level, I think that's incredible. Uh, if you ever need any help with that, I'd be more than willing to, um, to, to give you my insight. And I've developed things in the past and so forth. Um, so, so I think that would be key because doing things manually is not, efficient in this case because the the predators way out way the amount of people that want to solve this problem in my opinion the bandwidth naturally so i agree all right uh let's let's go into a little bit more um uh let's let's talk about uh let's see where we're at here uh we've we've talked about educating the masses we've talked about contra land which i'm going to personally watch tonight um what let, let's go into a little bit about um, you and uh, what developed you as an individual. We talked about your father earlier on, who was a great man that wanted to help the community, kind of influenced you to say, hey, this is something I want to protect as well, which is, um, you know, being a Navy SEAL and protecting America and what America stood for. And now you're protecting the community. So you kind of went back to the roots of your father and kind of um, protecting what's at home, uh, seeing things that are rotting. W what are some books that have deeply impacted you? You mentioned faith, but is there a book out there that someone should read uh, that may change their life? A friend of my dad's was a banker. He's very successful, and and he had multiple businesses. He had a warehousing business in Houston, and managed a series of banks. and And uh, I asked him. I said, Bob you know, I'm not going to go to college first. I'm going to continue reading and studying throughout my adult lifehood, life, lifetime. What do you, where do you recommend I start? Like as a series of books or what, you know, and he said, you cannot beat the Holy Bible for wisdom. He goes, what you're trying to gain throughout your lifetime of experience is wisdom and wisdom is understanding how things really work. So he goes, the Bible is whiz. It's full of wisdom. It's a love story between the creator and us. And it, it's sharing wisdom and how we are to be from the inside out. He goes, that will be overwhelmingly your best start. Mm -hmm. And from there, once you have a command of that knowledge of that way of being the way, then consume all the rest of the stuff and it'll make a lot more sense and you can utilize it much more effectively. I thought, wow, that's brilliant. And then, uh, you know, I, as m many young people do, I got distracted and didn't do it so much. And I've just been tying into it very heavily this last several years. Again, after we encountered evil firsthand with, with uh, Veterans for Child Rescue and the, the child trafficking, we're all growing spiritually. We're all like, okay, these people on the dark side, these witches covens and these satanic cult group members, they have their ceremonies and they have their you know procedures and they're dedicated. Mm -hmm. dark and sick individuals as they are as despicable as they are boy they're dedicated they put energy into it they put effort and they have their stuff and they do their stuff and 
Why wouldn't we do that? If we mean for good to prevail, for love to prevail, for truth to prevail, why wouldn't we put, you know, any effort into it that way to develop ourselves? So that I would say, really, I have found to be true. Uh, that Bible, the the Holy Bible, it's not just like some fairy tale. It is it is a book of wisdom and how things really work. And so many people talking about the way things are playing out globally right now, they're like, it's all in the Bible. It's a supernaturally inspired document that is not bound by time or space. And so it does keep breathing out these, these truths that, you know, were known from the beginning. So it's, it's a, it's a wild experience to read it and understand it. And from that perspective. Understood. I appreciate you saying that. I definitely agree. It, 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 it's almost like the moral compass or the foundation of a home. You know, it, it, it really, and everything's built up from there. Um, Very much. You, you have been through a lot in your life. You're obviously older than I am. Uh, you look great, but uh, um, you've been in Navy SEAL missions. You've, uh, I'm, you probably have murdered on the mission. I don't know. You know, I'm just saying it's, I don't know what goes on into those missions. Uh, you've took out bad guys, you've helped um, bring people back, but all this stays in the mind. And ultimately, you may relive these moments during sleep, you may relive these moments in certain days of good and bad moments, right? How do you unwind and recharge yourself um, to put some of these, what you've experienced as potentially traumatic experiences um, how do you, how do you reset yourself? How do you unwind? What, what's your, how do you sleep at night with a gut punch? You know what I mean? And, and these things yeah. that you've been through. Seeing this, this horror with being done to children is upsetting and it, and it could rob you from your sleep if you're not able to find a way, a, a method. Here's my thing. I learned through, there's an Institute of heart math a one word heart math. And they're doing studies on Tibetan monks in laboratories. And these Tibetan monks are generating these large electromagnetic fields around their body. And they're asking the monks how they're doing it. And the monks are explaining they're doing it from the emotion, uh, from the heart, not from the mind, but from the heart organ itself. They're focusing on this um, compassion. So they're sitting and they're meditating in a on compassion and the heart, they're, they're learning now that heart has about 40,000 cells on it that are like brain cells. They're cognitive cells, but a, but a simpler, not a higher, uh, it's like a yes or no, true or false, good or bad kind of um, cognition. But in this emotional state of, of giving off this, this emotion of like breathing it out of compassion, for me, it's gratitude. They're saying they, they measure those frequencies of those emotions are being about the same gratitude i just sit down well first of all back to the monks so they're they're meditating and they're generating this this compassion and their brain responds to the heart organ and then up and down the spinal cord uh goes this repeated conversation electromagnetic conversation and the heart continually pulses this gratitude and the, and the brain responds and that from that grows this toroidal electromagnetic field it's very powerful it, it resets their hormones their brains go into what they refer as a, a gamma wave state which is a very high rate of speed and for me i just sit and i i i focus on gratitude and i just give thanks so it's a it's a prayer of gratitude for literally everything like this breath i just took is a gift and it allows me to just slow down and contemplate that and go, wait a minute. Nobody promised me, nobody owes me another breath, another sunrise, another lesson learned. You know, I should be grateful for this. And I am grateful for this. I'm grateful for all the healing and the recoveries and all the things with my family and like everything that I'm able to do. And whenever I'm able to help someone, that feels amazing to me. So I'm grateful for that chance and that opportunity. And I'm sitting there, I'm just giving this gratitude and emotions. Just I, I can bring myself to tears very quickly, just focusing on that gratitude. 
And that you, I can feel that electromagnetic field. My hands and feet start buzzing. And so when I do that and that gratitude, the Bible says in all things, give thanks. Right? The Bible doesn't give a breakdown into a big science lesson and a bunch of stats and all that. In everything, give thanks. It's a basic principle. It's a how-to. Mm -hmm. And now the scientists are starting to figure out a little bit more of the details within that truth of we should give thanks and everything but for me when i just give gratitude and thanks for everything i start feeling better i start kind of just finding a peace and a beauty and a tranquility so that's kind of my meditation is really it's a prayer of, of gratitude just thank doing that every single morning you know i'll bring my coffee outside and i'll sit and i'll just pour out my heart and gratitude to the creator and thank him for literally everything I can think of. And it'll, the list is long and I feel like I feel amazing and I sleep well. And, uh, you know, I try to do the best I try to do right all day, every day. And the more I do that, the better I feel. And it's just, it's self perpetuating. There's a momentum with pursuing what is righteous, if you will, what is pure, what is good, what is, um you know what is beneficial what are, what what is in harmony with the 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 kingdom of heaven right mm -hmm. the frequency of the creator and the love and the compassion and the forgiveness and all of that when you decide that that's going to be your way and you're going to follow what yeshua taught us and showed us to do um and and the bible every all the nasty ugly stuff kind of starts fading in the distance and gets very dim and faint and the light becomes much more trying to, you're pursuing it. It's a beautiful process and I encourage it highly, highly, highly for anybody. Um, so that's my deal, man. And it, boy, it works. That's it a, works. that's a big, big, uh, piece of advice, everybody that, you know, uh, no matter what you're going through, no matter what has happened, you have to have some light to shine on the darkness, to be thankful for everything that you have. Cause life is not guaranteed, right? Like you said, at your last breath, is not guaranteed and no one knows and and uh, you know it, it, yeah i'm a true believer if you're put on this earth to to make a positive happen and and everybody has a journey um let's uh i have some other questions about you craig because again not every day do i get a very interesting individual such as yourself who again is an ex navy seal um com uh, combating child trafficking etc this is to me these are the conversations of why I built this podcast studio. I think they're more important than financial conversations personally to me. Um, if you could have dinner with any person, living person, obviously, uh, who would it be with and why? Uh, what? Who would you have a conversation with that you're like, hey, I want to talk to someone um, out there and it'd be a great conversation to have? I, I've never been one to be starstruck. Uh, but I have been blessed to meet so many people of of high net worth, of you know, big fame, political status. Um, there are a lot of people that I would really like to meet. One of them right now, uh, Stephen McWhorter. I happen to love his style, but I I love more the is a Christian singer, and okay. when you listen to a mu his music. There's a reverence and a contrition there that is palpable. Like you can feel his sincerity when he sings to his creator. That fascinates me. That's beautiful. I've been running around like a maniac sharing his stuff uh, with, with everybody this last few weeks. And I listen to his stuff almost uh, around the clock. I hope I don't burn myself out on it. So pure and it's love. And it's, it inspires me, it motivates me. And um, yeah, I just, I really appreciate his art and, and more so his heart. And so that's a guy I would just like to kick, put my boots up and say, hey man, you know, tell me a little bit more about your story or. All right, that's good. Thank you for sharing. I have to check him out. Um, all right. And then if, okay, there's a couple more. If you, uh, what skill would you wish you have mastered? I mean, You've mastered a lot of skills. You, you're a top sniper in your area. You, you're obviously very personable on, on media now. Um, 
to go through, again, we're not going to discuss Navy SEALs, but I've done a little research just on the surface level. It's challenging. Not everybody's going to be able to pass that. But what skill do you wish uh, uh, you had mastered that you feel like you haven't mastered yet? What are you shooting for as far as a skill set? Is there one? I talked about that building out that spiritual room in your house to be a, cl a complete man or woman. Uh, that's what I've been that's the last refuge that I think I really needed to build out and, and um, that's all consuming and it's beautiful. And I'm just kind of immersed in that. But one thing I can admit is, you know, there are things that came easy for me. I was able to excel in several different things. I mean, I, I started racing motocross and became a road, motocross and supercross racing champion in Las Vegas. And there are a lot of things that I was able to do. And one thing I could never do, I was terrible at it is, Saw man can't hoop. I am terrible. We grew up with a basketball hoop on our garage. My dad and my brother and I used to play horse, and and I I've thrown a lot of balls at hoops, and I'm terrible at it. Man, I just I cannot hoop. It's perplexing. I played basketball in high school, and I was just too short. But that's that's funny. I mean, I was terrible. It's pathetic. It's it's, it's, it's bad. I mean, okay, it, it throw stuff at me and go get him off the field, get him off the court. You're What's not. You're not shooting three pointers like Stephen Curry. This is not no, happening. No, okay. <laughs> no, in fact, I had a better chance of throwing those than 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 up. You know, close. I was just from throwing them from half court or whatever, just horsing around. But you know I what I uh, what I realize is uh, just like you know, I have a 16 month old son and uh, 17 months now, and uh, I I was such a basketball guy when I was growing up, and I was just go out in the yard and my parents were both working my dad's a tailor my mom had a daycare and uh i would just i didn't we didn't have a yard so i'd go to a playground i'd climb over to the school the fence and just hoop 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 but i'm noticing that a lot of times i wish like my parents would have put me into like some type of martial arts or like jujitsu or some of these other things that are out there where hooping is great uh but the skill set I feel like for for me to teach my son, I would put him into some martial arts to, to be able to defend sure. himself from bullying, from a situation yeah. of him being grabbed, a situation of him kind of uh, being humbled, right? Because you go into these gyms and particularly I've been doing jujitsu in, in those gyms, you could get humbled. You could think you're a tough guy and, and then all of a sudden you're going to get some guys that's just going to whip you up like a pretzel, right? So, yeah. And... Uh, basketball it's great it's good for cardio it's good for all these things and and uh, don't be too upset that you weren't so it's good not at a it. lifesaver yeah it's not a lifesaver because i think the skill sets you've learned are are gonna be a much better lifesaver um overall uh where do you see yourself in the future what would you like to accomplish with your um uh you know the vets for uh child recovery and where do you see yourself going what is what does the ideal 2024 look like for you, Craig? Yeah, well, what I'm trying to do is be obedient to what the creator would have me do. And that is expose this and bring a massive cultural turnaround. So I'm doing everything that I can identify to do in that regard. Well, there's um, There are investigations on major trafficking rings and, and corruption networks that we are investigating and we will expose uh, one of them mid-year this year. Uh, another one probably will take a little bit longer. But big, big throwing the lives of a lot of children. So that's what we're doing. We're filming a 10-part documentary series. Um, now that we've done a lot of the work, it, I don't think it'll take very long to film those 10 parts and get that edited. We just launched our TV show that we filmed over a year ago, a TV talk show, Defending Our Children. All these things will be or are already linked on our website. Um, I do a lot of public speaking. I'm glad to do that and meet a lot of people. We see them wearing our merch, you know, Vets for Child Rescue merch. That's cool. Drinking our coffee now and rescue roast. So those kinds of things, just continuing to, to disrupt the predators' um, war, what I call their war on children. It's yeah. just, there's a hatred for children that, that defies all natural logic. So disrupting that in every way that we can running more sting operations uh carrying through more investigations getting more prosecutions with federal and local law enforcement and then exposing the whole thing through more documentary content we've got a radio show as well 
uh, that we that airs every week that defending our children that's on our linked on our website as well so and i'll put all these links in and we'll obviously communicate back you mentioned some high profile people you also mentioned uh, uh epstein and giselle maxwell in in um uh previously big big topic going around the internet and all these uh podcasts do you think uh this guy offed himself or do you think he's so big up there that they wanted to get rid of him in in his uh before he spoke out about it even further it seems clear to me that he he either uh was murdered or abducted he might be alive he might be alive somewhere is what you're saying maybe who knows possible based on the capabilities of our of our intelligence community yeah. Um, and the level of corruption and the, and the level of network that, that has that, uh, yeah, I think they're, they're so determined. So I don't, I really know which one it is, but it's pretty clear that he didn't break his larynx or whatever the bone was with, uh, paper sheets already a suicide risk. So they had multiple, um, processes in place to ensure that it, they didn't lose him that way. So whatever happened he clearly did not kill himself it's insane i i feel that too it's uh i i you know i, I posed this question to someone else on the podcast before is this guy's probably you know is this guy alive and uh based on kind of your intelligence and everything that you've been part of they could totally pull it off if they want to drag him out of there and open the gate to to sell and pull him out at any point especially with a camera being off it's it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, all the cameras were shut down, right? Of the operation during the window that they would have needed, all those cameras were offline. It's insane, and that's America. That's what's happening, and it's uh, it's um, I don't know. I, I I personally, you know, my biggest fear is the children. Um, I think also um, I'll add to this. I I think with child trafficking and um, and kind of what you're going back to as well, and and the way things are being run, child trafficking, drug importation um all the bad stuff that's happening with the open borders uh in america is just it it kind of enables this flow it's like you have a leaky roof and you're not fixing it and then of course you're gonna have a puddle on your floor you know what i mean and then now you're dealing with a flood um and uh i i think that should be addressed um as well if if truly if they want to stop something right which they're capable of doing I, I think that if if the government said, "Hey, we're not, we're instead of you know sending a billion dollars here, we're going to put a billion dollars at the border fence," no one's getting through with you know improperly, right? I'm not against immigration, uh, you know, but proper immigration I think is important. Um, they they haven't done that, and I think that makes it uh, extremely hard for individuals and, and groups like yourself to prevent this type of trafficking, to prevent this type of uh, uh, influx of children coming in and out or or even drugs coming in and out it's even worse so we have government contracts busing and flying children deep into the united states children who are brought in illegally we used to we the, me and the, the american the usa border patrol used to swab uh, do rapid dna tests on children to make sure that the the men that were with them were their you know or, or the adults with them were their biological parents that quit three years ago no excuse as to why just not doing that so now the children are not as safe why we're not given a reason it just is the way it is abandon the border border patrol are made not to enforce they're made to instead facilitate the illegal immigration was, why like you said you're not anti-immigration none of us are that's yeah. the whole lie and the ideological subversion. Well, if you don't want with this mass like invasion, then you must be anti-immigration. It's like, no, we want control. We yeah. want we want a reasonable protective mechanism like every country on earth has you. Do you belong in? Yes or no? Nope. Sorry. You do you belong in? Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. Here you go through a methodical rational safe process that's good for everybody not just chaos and mayhem where isis and al-qaeda and ms-13 and porn in and chinese spies and 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 families who just want to come here and work right we're getting everything faith on the on the behalf of the american citizens so imagine finding out that there are government contracted flights to fly undocumented mig migrant children in the dark at night 
two dark airfields where it's illegal to land past midnight. They're landing at three and four with an aircraft that has a tail number that registers the companies that have been out of business for a year. So bogus tail number. Who does that? Who runs that kind of operation? How does the CIA, how does the FBI allow that? How does someone work there that, Thank I, you. I mean, how? Thank you, exactly. It doesn't make how? sense. No, it doesn't. And then a manifest that says, an illegal FAA manifest that says cargo. Instead of souls, when 20 or 30 children are taken off and shoved into POVs or buses and raced off of that dark airfield, in the dark of night, like a like a covert narcotics or weapons drop. Up. Yeah, like Why almost a Navy do we SEAL. we move children like that? It's like a Navy SEAL mission or something, or a mission yes. that's so covert. But how? how? There has to be who? There has to be someone in the FBI or the CIA that knows about these. I mean, you have someone exactly. flying these the, children. How do they trust someone to not come out with it? It doesn't even. It's not a small operation, right? In order to do this, this isn't like ten guys that are controlling, um, you know, something local or this is big. There's a right. person yeah. on the end, uh, on this end, on that end. That's why you're saying the government's involved. But how we is used it? To, do they HHS, Health and Human Services, used to vet, meaning do a background check on a sponsor. And a sponsor means someone who, uh, who, an adult who says that's my child or I'm going to adopt that child. They used to run background checks and vet them. They no longer do. Now we have HHS employees whistleblowing, saying we are racing children to unvetted sponsors. So we're taking children from the border without their parents, and we're taking them to rapists, yep. organ, um, organ harvesting runners or who, whomever they are. We're, we're delivering them to all kinds of people. What on earth are we doing? On what planet is that rational, reasonable, or even acceptable? It's it's just so, it goes beyond gross mismanagement. This is this is a, a, a major betrayal of, of the good faith of the American people. We don't want these children. They're all God's children. They're all precious. Every single one. Every single one. And the fact that this is going on at an industrial scale is sickening. It should, it should rattle the soul of every single American until we get a handle on this. These, these employees, they're asked, like, what, what, you know, what do your superiors say when you say, hey, I'm delivering children to people that we shouldn't be delivering to? I can tell they're bad. What? And they're shut up and just do your job and hurry up because there's the next, the next. Or you're going to lose your pension. You're going to lose yeah. this job. You're going to lose your family. Oh, my God. And they're pressured. Has there been, a like, obviously, different uh, president and different administrations. Has there been an administration in the past, you know, five administrations that has really combated child trafficking? Or has it always kind of just floated and now exponentially increased because of the, the way things are being done? It seems as though the Trump administration, he spoke out against it. And it does seem as though he's very much against the pedophilia and child trafficking thing. I wouldn't say it radically changed under his watch. It's my opinion that there are many dozens of federal agencies that are counterproductive. They're not, not only are they not productive, they're counterproductive. They're, they add to the bureaucratic red tape and expense and inefficiency of our, of our nation. And, and they, they serve no good purpose. I think, any of a number of those could, could be deleted, eradicated, and we should stand up an agency that deals directly against child traffickers and child rapists. Who you're affiliated with, what's on your collar, what's on your desk or outside of your door, you know, I would say uh, status be damned. You cannot be allowed to harm children. That's, that's where I'd love to see us get as a nation. I don't care what your title is. I agree. You need to be dealt with. You know, it's interestingly enough, I think uh, the uh, state of Florida, which I've been visiting a lot lately for vacations and stuff. And uh, again, I live in the Bay Area, which is complete opposite thinking. I th they just approved in California here. I don't know if you know, uh, Newsom approved um, uh, illegal free health care for illegal immigrants, uh, which is crazy, right? Not even for veterans or, or the U.S. Uh, population, but also free health care for illegal immigrants. 
But also what that covers is uh, um, uh, child uh, transition, so gender uh, surgery. <laughs> Part of that free health care for illegal immigrants. Basically, now a child could come in uh, or be trafficked in illegally by one of these coyotes or, or traffickers, and they could get uh, gender uh, um, transitioning surgery here on the taxpayer dollar. Now, you take a state like Florida recently, they passed a law where if you're a pedophile, now you could be prosecuted for a death penalty. Um, and uh, I personally say that's a positive thing in my opinion, uh, because it really puts uh, the fear of someone that's a, a pedophile or like you've described on these chat groups in the state of Florida to not really mess around. It's, it's a serious, serious punishment, right? This isn't a slap on yeah. the wrist. Yeah. But what also yeah. that's going to do is I feel like if the states are not united to combat this type of trafficking or this type of child um, uh, endangerment, right? One state is lax on it. Another state is very heavy on it. It's going to have people from Florida literally just move to California where that type of penalty doesn't exist and, and it doesn't uh, really punish the individual committing this type of crime. So, it, it, you know, it, it's not only a United States thing it, or a U.S. as a country. I feel like if you have complete division of states and there's no right direction for where this is going to go, they're just going to migrate to the states that are allowing it. Yuri Bezmenov was a Russian KBG, KGB defector, mm -hmm. and he warned us very eloquently in a series of lectures about ideological subversion okay. and how they were going to break down our culture. So our enemies could not beat us with tanks, planes, and guns. They knew it. Our, our industry was too strong. Our military was too strong, and our will our unity was too strong. So they decided that they would um, break down our culture, that which made us strong from the inside, mm -hmm. our faith in Jesus Christ, our our um, constitution, our most protective document. They would tear that down. They would discredit our founding fathers. They would um, discredit the, the family unit, the nuclear family unit with a strong masculine father and a, and that combination that's approved unbeatable over time. They would, they would, this credit and try to break that up and, and state would take the child at the earliest possible age. All of these things, that ideological subversion that would that would demoralize and destabilize the United States, that state of dysfunction and then usher in their their greater, quote unquote, greater uh, solution which essentially ends up being global Marxism. The 45 communist goals of overthrowing the United States without firing a single shot was read before Congress back in 1963. And it involved, uh, you know, overthrowing or in, infiltrating all our different institutions and programming our people to give up our uh, a single shot. So you realize what all is going on there with, with Newsom, with these radical, uh, irresponsible and reckless and destructive policies of his. Well, you talk about the social programs, that's the Cloward Piven strategy. That's a communist strategy, strategy and the way that it works as an oversimplified version is they they squander all of the money through all the social services it's never such thing as too much yes you've never come here you have no loyalty to our country bring all your we'll throw free everything at you why to bankrupt our nation our economy again to leave us destitute so that we're asking for a solution which the cabal comes in oh by the way it happens to be global marxism once you understand their objective once you understand, to use a soccer game analogy, that they mean to kick the ball into the net behind you, then you can begin disrupting what they're doing. So I already see, I, I see who Newsom is, and I see who's pulling his strings, and I know the kind of destructive policy. He's always going to bring some that's bad for the people. Always, 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 right? Because he, he doesn't serve the people. He serves our enemies. And once you know that, then you're not surprised by anything he does anymore. But that's Cloward Piven straight out of the straight out of the book. Yeah, they're they're uh, bringing them in. Not only are they um, causing the community disruptions. I mean, we've seen it even in Chicago recently, where schools had to get shut down to accommodate all these migrant children, and some children were missing and so forth. 
but they're also getting the vote, right? When you give out things for free and you're not requiring someone to register to vote or to uh, show an ID or you mentioned swabbing cheeks to, to see who's who, the DNA of people and so forth. Uh, you're not really tracking anybody. They're buying uh, power, right? Which it all ultimately comes down to, or you're maintaining your power. And it's very sad. Um, Craig, I truly appreciate you coming on. Um, we talked about who you are, the importance of uniting against child trafficking. I think that's the really big picture here is like at one point, everybody should accept the reality that this is a big thing and it's a it's a terrible thing and it's a, it's not a problem under the rug that we you know should avoid it's a problem that we should uh tackle head on and unite um very interesting um things happening in the world where the media doesn't want you to know about it the we've talked about how the government is potentially involved in it um and I truly appreciate you coming on and giving us more than an hour of your time. Um, I would love to have you on again in the future when you are more free to, to talk about your journey in the Marine Corps and the Navy SEAL. But I think this was such a more important uh, discussion. I think it's cooler to talk about operations and all this. But in reality, uh, if if this uh, podcast can help get the word out. I, I, I really appreciate you doing that. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate you again, giving a platform to get the truth out and folks, look, I realize it can be discouraging to hear that we are being betrayed, that we are being deceived and ripped off. But since it is true, it is empowering to know it. And Simon said, it. we have to unite. The beauty is then you can't swing your coat without hitting something that needs correcting. There's opportunity there. That's a chance to do something good. A lot of people are like, Craig, you know, you guys are heroes. I want to be a hero. I'm like, you can be a hero. We can all be heroes now because the problem's great enough to where we can all do something that changes this, and we should. And we each get to contribute in our own way. Some people are graphic artists. Some people are talkers. Some people are whatever. But we need to spread the word, empower each other. Love has to prevail. That means truth and light have to prevail. So shine the light on the darkness. We're all called to do that. Light it up, man. Let people see. Sunlight is the best antiseptic for corruption. And so there's great opportunity. Be encouraged. You matter. You have power. And I would say find your voice. Find your platform. Connect with other people. I and mean, you can do that probably through our vet, our website too. But just find your mojo, find your um, your way of contributing to the greater good, and you'll feel that you'll, you'll discover that you like it, and it'll be encouraging, and you develop your own momentum. And I uh, just I celebrate it. I celebrate the mama bears that that are, are not afraid, and mm -hmm. they're like you will not harm my child, you will not groom yeah. or or program my child. And uh, man, if only once that starts really catching fire, we're gonna have ourselves a better country again. So. God bless everybody that stands up and speaks bold truth because we must. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, uh, kudos to those individuals standing up in, in front of those classrooms and in front of all these people that that uh, judge them or speaking out against uh, things that we've discussed. And, and it takes a lot, but once a lot of people do it and someone does it uh, first and then a lot of people follow, it will make a change, like you said. Thank you so much, Craig, for coming on the Ideal Hour. I truly appreciate it. Um, it was my pleasure, uh, actually an honor of mine. Uh, I, I really appreciate your time and, and I hope you get as much out there and we'll link uh, everything below from your Instagram, real underscore saw man to your website um, to where people can not only donate, but also contribute tips, et cetera. Um, you know, give some of their time to improve what's happening. So thank you.